What a blessing that that, <laughs> what a blessed truth that that song portrays and beautifully done too. I appreciate that. Music is such a, an encouragement to the heart, isn't it? can always be used as a weapon against discouragement, we're told. And uh, it definitely lifts us up. Rightly done, it lifts us up toward the Lord. I'm so glad that each of you are here tonight. Uh, what a blessing it is to have each of you be a part of the OH family now. And uh, it's, it's always an encouragement to hear some of the stories of how God brought people here. And I know from my wife and myself, it's transition times of where do I go next or what's happening. That those transitional times are the times that I've, I've, I've sensed the closest, I've been, I've been the closest to Jesus. And, and I, I know some of you have had those kind of experiences in, in coming here. And we are so glad that uh, each of you students are here. And we're so glad that uh, that's not all who are here. <laughs> uh, it takes, uh, of course, first, it's the Lord's presence that makes true education. And then there needs to be, yes, some students. What else do we need? We need some staff, some teachers to be a part of this, to encourage and bless and share and I wanted to just say thank you to the Lord publicly for providing for the needs of our school with staff who are committed, who are desiring to follow him. You know, I, I really appreciated you mentioning about having worship with your family. That is so needed by all of us, all of our families, uh, staff families. We need those personal family worships as well. I just wanted to mention a few. I know those of you students who are new, I don't know that we've had any kind of introduction of all the staff. I'm not going to do that right now, but I, I do want to introduce to you the new staff. So at least if students were here last year, all of the ones I'll mention are probably new to them as well. Uh, I want to mention to Laura. Is she? Where is she? Raise your hand. Okay, Laura, or to Laura Calkins, she is a graduate from this, this year uh, in May, and we're so happy to have her be here teaching English and some science classes too, or math? Math, yeah, that's right. All right, you're hoping I don't change what you're teaching, right? <laughs> All right, and, and Steve Chacon, where is he? Oh, in the back there, you're going to hear more from him soon. He, was a, he was, was a student here, and he's probably going to share a little bit about that uh, about 10 years ago, I think, former student, and, and uh, he's, he's going to be sharing tonight. And we're so thankful for Henny Homan. Where is she? Uh, she's not a stranger around here, having had Jonathan graduate here in 2018, and, and this year, by God's grace, Dylan will be all done and graduated by next May, but... Uh, we're so thankful that you're here on board, and thank you, Mr. Hickman, Ray Hickman, for staying with us through the audit time and, and getting Henny all trained in and ready <laughs> to take that. Uh, and also for Fernando and Emily Martins, what a, what a blessing they are, coming to us from Houston uh, area, and you'll be hearing more from them in a moment as well. And Handel and Minju. Is Minju sitting out here somewhere? Oh, there you are. Oh, the both of you are. Okay. Yeah, so glad to have them uh, from Korea via uh, Wildwood or <laughs> anyway. We're, we're so glad that you all are here, and we're going to hear more from you as well. But we're glad to have new staff that are seeking to come and make this place a better place, a place that we are more closely following our mission that God has given us. If you'll follow with me in uh, Isaiah 43, it's uh, an interesting passage here starting with verse 10, but before I do that, I want to ask you a question while you're looking for that, and that is, what is heaven's chosen agency for revealing Christ to the world? Do you know what it is? Okay, in, in, in a roundabout, he says it's the church. And we're getting really close. That's pretty much what it is. But it's especially lifting up 
God's faithfulness in my life. That's his revealed, chosen agency to reveal Jesus. And I want to look at verses 10 through 12 here. In Isaiah 43, verse 10, the Bible says, Ye are my witnesses. You know, there's a big controversy going on. There's really a big court case, and we're the judge. People are the judge. Is he really faithful? Is he really who he said? Or the enemy says, no, he's not. But he says, yes. And the way he proves it is by his work in your life and you speaking for him as a witness. He says, you are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen. You are chosen. That ye may know and believe me. That's what he cho has chosen us for, to be witnesses that know him. You know, a witness that doesn't know what they're talking about isn't worth <laughs> being a witness. But he says that you know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved, I have showed there, uh, sorry, when there was no strange God among you, therefore you are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. That quote that I mentioned to you earlier, answering that question of what is heaven's chosen agency, listen to this, from Desire of Ages, our confession of his faithfulness is heaven's chosen agency for revealing Christ to the world. We are to acknowledge his grace as made known through the holy men of old, but that which will be most effectual is the testimony of our own experience. And if you feel like or think you don't have a testimony, pray to the Lord to give you one or help you see what it is. Because it's about pointing to him as saying, he's faithful in my life. I'm going to close with this uh, one uh, further quote further down in this same chapter. It is for our benefit to keep every gift of God fresh in our memory. What should be kept fresh in our memory? Every good gift of God. Thus, faith is strengthened to claim and to receive more and more. There is greater encouragement for us. Get this. Listen carefully. There is greater encouragement for us in the least blessing we ourselves receive from God than in all the accounts that we read of faith and experience of others. God wants to be, he wants to prove himself faithful in each of our lives this year. And you know, uh, the word history, uh, it, it reminds us or tells us it's the things that have happened in the past. But if you break down history, what does it become? His story. We're going to have three stories for you tonight from some of our new staff, and I'm thankful for them, and I'm thankful for what they will share, though I don't know all of the story yet. I'm going to hear it. It's his story. You know, Scripture says in Revelation 12, 1, and they overcame him, the enemy, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. God wants us to know he is faithful personally to you. And may we each be blessed as different of our families, three of our families share. First, we're going to have the Smiths, Handel and Minju, share with us, sharing some of the things that he's done in the past, some of the Bible verses that have seen them through. May you be encouraged by what they share. And then Fernando and Emily as they share, and then Steve will end. May it be a real encouragement to hear his story in their life. I'm going to read from Proverbs chapter 3, 
verse 5 is very famous verse. Trust in the Lord with all thine hearts, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. I'm just going to quickly share how we came to Wachita Hills, you know. And uh, we, were, we came from South Korea, and uh, it was actually last year, around December, my husband was almost finishing his job contract. So we were talking about where we should go next. And uh, out of blue, one of the graduates from Wachita Hill, uh, his name is Brent Stone. He is my close friend, so, you know, my husband. And he's like, why don't you go to Wachita Hills? You know, they are looking for a media director. And um, he told me about, you know, he's thinking of going there. I'm like, uh, where are we going? <laughs> I'm like, oh, Kent and uh, Arkansas. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know where the, uh, even Arkansas is. And uh, I was like, I, we were in Wildwood before. So Wildwood is pretty close to Atlanta. And uh, Wildwood is also, there are Korean church in 30 minutes. So I was okay there, and then I was complaining to my husband, I don't see any Asian there if I go there. <laughs> there's no Asian stores, and there's, if I, I don't get to go around the area because I cannot really drive the car very well, I'm not really, really comfortable with the cars. So I was mentioning all the difficulties that I will have, and also I began my braces like a year, ago and I haven't finished my braces so I was laying out all the list of why we cannot go to the place and I didn't even have a visa to come to America so I was telling my husband well I'm more like Thomas you know I have to see things that are actually happening in order to believe it so but one thing that I learned in my Christian walk is when my husband is more like having, you know, we need to walk by faith. Because if God tells us to do something, we need to do it. But for me, it's like when he's telling me to do something, it's like telling me to grab the cloud. How can I grab, grab the clouds? It's not possible. It is impossible to do, you know, what you're telling me to do. And the coming to watch Tyler's was like that. You know, he's telling me to grab the clouds. Like, uh, I don't think we're going there. It's not possible. But... Finally, I submit my will to God. Okay, God, if you really want us to go there, there must be the reason, and you should open the door widely. Because a year ago, we tried to come to the States, but not here, but another place. But that door didn't open. So I thought, oh, maybe we should stay in Korea, which is more comfortable. I'm with my families. Everything will go well. But uh, one thing that we needed was a sponsors to come to the States. And uh, after we decide to come here, God provide a sponsor out of blue again. That was a really miracles. The other thing was that um, I was like, again, complaining about my braces. And he's like, if you go there, there's a dentist who can help you bra help with your braces. I go, OK, then that, that problem is also gone. <laughs> and. Uh, other than that, all the things I realized that I can just continually seek for my own comfort. And I don't know why I need to go there, but when I go there, I will find out why I need to be there. And um, because of your prayers, when I came here, I heard that you guys have been praying for us when we had a little difficulties with my, our visa problems. So I'm very grateful. And uh, when I came here, uh, Ms. Diaz was continually, every day, was telling me that we've been praying for you. We've been praying for you. And uh, I heard from also many other people that we've been praying for us to come. So, and it is really a humbling experience for me that such as I, you know, who am I, you know, and they're praying for me to just to come here to, you know, serve you guys and serve God. So, I feel like I'm entering the new school, not you guys are only students, but I'm also feel like uh, becoming a student here, another journey 
you know, to learn more about God's character. So um, I hope that uh, you will continually pray for us. And uh, I also continue to pray that I'll be, a, you know, a very good um, service for you guys and for God as well. Thank you. <clears throat> How did we get here? She said everything, basically, that I was going to say. So <laughs> Bible verses is about the same. Um, I'm going to, you guys mind if I say something different? Okay, good. Um, long time ago, in a place far, far away, in Korea, I, uh, there was a man, there lived a, a man and a woman who went to Korea to enjoy uh, working for the Lord in missions. Mm -hmm. As they went there, they found a little church called Yongdo, and at that church, there was a pastor named, uh, well, they had, actually, they have had several pastors, but the latest one was Yi byung -yeol. And at this place, this man was on fire for God, and his family was on fire for God, and they decided to do some ministry work. And this man and his wife decided to uh, touch lives by stretching their hands out in love, using their skills, massage and hydrotherapy, and the, the church people who are all over 50, 55, loved it. And they gravitated to the church, and they told their friends in the community, and they said, wow, this is great. Now, as, they, as that happened, uh, there were other places, uh, they, there were actually other places in the community that these, this couple wanted to go to. And they said, wow, we can reach the people at our church here, or we can reach out to the community down there. So they did health programs in the community. And then... After the health expos, five years in a row, they said, hmm, what can they do? Ah, maybe we can reach the people where they're at. The elderly decided to have these meetings in these elderly facilities. And uh, they would go there and do massage and hydrotherapy and so on. Now, this ministry was going well and uh, the couple was uh, happy to stay, but they realized that the Lord was calling them somewhere else. And when the, when the door opened for them to come, she told you all the details already, <laughs> to the United States, uh, this church was very sad. And uh, so they bought a massage chair <laughs> to kind of replace um, the, the couple. <laughs> It's a little difficult, <laughs> but uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but in, in any case, um, we had to say goodbye to our, our church family, and uh, my mother-in-law actually goes to that church, um, and she's still there uh, trying to encourage our father-in-law to go also. Uh, please, I ask that you pray for my father-in-law, because he used to be Adventist a long time ago, and now he's looking for, um, he, uh, we are looking to invite him back to the church continually. Um, and so pray, pray for him. He's uh, in the world right now. And also, I ask that you pr please pray for our church members at that church. They are, some of them are dying off, and um, we need another missionary to go there. So, um, yes, our friend Brent, which is, was a coworker, invited us to go there. Uh, to come here, and um, that's pretty much, you stole my thunder. <laughs> I was, I was going to give them the whole story, but uh, no worries. Um, I will tell you more as time progresses, but for now, that little church in Busan, in, in Yangdo, uh, is still reaching out to the community, a community of people who are Buddhists and uh, Christians in the world, and are full of people who are into secularism, and um, they really do need a lot of prayer. Thank you. But, uh, sometimes God winks at people, right? You experience that? Remember I was telling you that one of the, my first complaints not when I wanted to come here was I will not see any Koreans. <laughs> I met Josh, where Josh? Yeah. I met him when he was a little boy. 
his father and I used to work for the same school. Mm -hmm. So I was very surprised to catch him here. <laughs> and yeah, uh, I see another, I see Moses here, I see Kepa here, and I see even two Jamaican girls who are speaking to me all the time in Korean. <laughs> I feel like God is winking at me. You, see, you, you complain that you will not see any Koreans. See what is the God is all I can do for you. So I'm very thankful for oh. all of you guys. By the by the way, if you guys would like to come to our house sometime, just ask. Just ask anytime, and we'll schedule you in because we really really want to do hospitality here. So, yeah. <laughs> all right. Good stuff. Thanks. God bless you. First thing I want to say that it's, it's a true blessing and honor to be here. Um, for the first time in my life, after leaving my parents' home 12 years ago, uh, I feel like I feel settled, you know? I feel like I can grow roots. And, um, you know, we planted trees in our garden, and I feel like that, that just testifies to our own souls that that we're feeling, we feel settled, because we would never do anything like that before. Um, in Houston, if we did home improvement, it was because we were gonna sell our house and get out of there, right? Everywhere we were, we said, this is not it. This is not what God has for us. This is not it. Surely this is not it. We're in the middle of a stinky city. You know, I can smell the, the fumes from the um, oil refineries, and this is not what God has for us, right? And, um, but now that I'm here, and I'm feeling this sense of settledness. I can't really describe it. I look back and I think all those places that we were, that's exactly where we needed to be. Exactly. God put us in touch everywhere we went. I feel like he brought us to different cities so he could, we could meet specific people, right? He got us in touch with people who pointed us to Jesus. And, and the exact right people at the exact right time, right? Our first, uh, my first encounter, I never heard of Seventh-day Adventist in my life until I met him. But uh, we, hadn't, we hadn't gone to church or anything until we went to Tennessee. And one day he said, okay, we're going to go to church. I said, fine. Um, and he's like, oh, it's on Saturday. I was like, okay, that's weird. But that's fine, I'll go. And uh, we met this pastor, right? And he was the exact person we needed to know at that time. He, he lifted up Jesus, he presented the love of Christ first, and I knew nothing about anything besides that. And when we went to Houston, then they were like, oh, Jesus, and then, but did you know Sunday Law and all these things? And I was like, whoa, really, that's awesome. <laughs> so, and then those people at the exact right time, it was providence all the way along. And, um, and I realized that we could not, or at least I could speak for myself, <laughs> have been here five years ago or two years ago or one year ago because I would have brought with myself some flawed character traits that would not necessarily have been a blessing. And um, not that I'm saying I'm perfect, right? Uh, but by the grace of God, I'm better than I am, you know, by, by his grace only. And also another thing, uh, I feel more settled in my, my calling. We had, both of us, it's like we were trying to run from music our entire lives. We would stray and stray and stray, and God brought us back and brought us back and brought us back. And, um, you know, I even thought, you know, surely God will let me be a medical missionary, right? You know, like, I can leave music and be a medical, because that's what he wants, right? And then so I started studying, and it was like as though God said to me, sure, you can be a gospel medical missionary, music therapist. Like, that's fine, you know, just, and he just brought me back, he brought me back. And uh, so I'm thankful, and I, I, you know, we're here to teach, but I know that beyond that, and more importantly, I'm here to learn from you. So that's my spiel. You wanna... <laughs> I guess that was the principle behind. Now I guess I'll get to the, where the rubber meets the road a little bit more. I grew up SDA. My family actually brought SDA to Brazil. 
from Germany. They built the first church in Brazil. So I'm a son of Abraham, <laughs> right? But that doesn't mean anything. Because I grew up, and looking back, I knew a lot of things, but I was like a Pharisee, I knew it, but I wasn't converted, you know? And uh, I came into the U.S. to uh, study violin, and I went to a couple of schools, California and Chicago, and I left God. Not that I stopped believing God, but I just told God, okay, God, you just wait over there. I'm going to do my thing over here. I'll talk to you later. Right? That's what I did. And in that time, that's when I met her, um, when I was away from the church. And we were long distance for a while, and um, as I was finishing my undergrad, things weren't going so well anymore. And I remember when my dad said, he used to tell me when I was young, he said, don't worry, everything will be okay, as long as you trust in God. And I think that really stuck with me. And I realized that if things were okay when you're trusting God, if things weren't going okay, it's because I wasn't trusting God. So, it was simple. I just had to trust in God again, right? So I started. And uh, one day, if you guys want to come over to babysit, I'll tell you the story in detail. Um, but we, we both ended up going to Tennessee, and at that time, I had decided to walk towards God again, you know, or meet Him again. Not that we need to walk. God is, we just need to look to the cross and He's right there next to us. He's never far away. Amen. Amen. And um, I told her, we're going to go to church. Because she was also searching. She was into Buddhism and all that stuff. And I, and I knew that she was searching. And I told her, I wasn't a dictator. I told her, hey, let's go to church. It's okay. On Saturday. And can you just see the providence in that? He was away from the church, right? And I was you know, searching, had never known the truth, didn't have the opportunity to know the truth. And God brings us together. And that's another crazy story. But do you see the mercy? Even when he uh -huh. is running away, he can, he can use you, you know? And so it was just the perfect, again, the perfect meeting of experience and minds. Yeah, it makes me think of the story of Bathsheba. Jesus comes from the lineage, you know? Think about that. And um, Rahab, a prostitute, and he comes from the lineage, people that decided to follow him. God is so merciful, you know. And so we uh, were going to church, and we were playing because they knew that we played the violin and the viola. And then... I think we invited people over, and then they realized that we were living together. We were not married. So they came to us and said, hey, we love you guys so much, but you know, you can't play anymore because you're not married. You're living together. But they, they did that in a very nice way. So we said, okay, well, let's get married then, if that's the problem. <laughs> right? And amen, because, you know, they, they was right. They didn't think, oh, well, maybe if we tell them, they're going to stop coming to the church. They said, well, what's yay is yay, nay is nay. And they told us. And then, because of that, we, we were walking towards, you know, we were searching and stuff. And, and then our pastor said, hey, so you guys want to get married? Okay, so do you guys want to do marriage counseling? And I said, Sure. By the way, well, I'll tell you something else first. In the marriage counseling, 
that's when we both found Jesus in the marriage counseling. So I urge you to, if you are planning on getting married, if you are already married, you've never done marriage counseling, do it. The marriage is such an example of our relationship with, with Jesus. We are the bride as a church, and he is the, he's the husband. And the marriage journey can be an object lesson. It's, it's a very humbling experience, you know, but it's designed by God. So please, don't get married without any counsel. It's the most important decision you're ever going to make in your life. In a, on a roly uh, standpoint. Anyways, um, as we got converted, you know, we remember all those things that we've done in our past lives, mm -hmm. things that I'm ashamed of. I'm ashamed of. And a verse that comes that was very important for me personally is 1 John 1 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Can Amen. I add something in there? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, during this time when we were doing our marriage counseling, like he said, um, I was being opened up. I was seeing my true self and my sin and I remember at night, I would just be crying and crying. And he's like, why are you crying? And I'm like, I'm such a bad person. I'm so horrible. I'm such a terrible person. And I didn't realize that then what was happening, but God was, God was converting my soul. He was, he was opening my true self up. And, um, you know, the law was held up, and, and I, saw, I saw myself. And if, you know, if someone asked me, you know, my story of conversion... Is this what we're even supposed to be talking about? I'm okay. Anyways, <laughs> we'll get there. All right. Um, it's, it's Romans 1.16, right? The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. I heard the gospel, and I was saved. Yeah. So, so as um, time progressed, time came for us to, we finished our studies, our master's in Knoxville. God had provided for that as well. Uh, I'll tell you how he did some other time. And because I like to give details, and that drives her nuts, because I make these huge uh, tangents, and she, anyways, I just did it. <laughs> we end up in Houston. Uh, we could have gone to Singapore almost, but God, I'll tell you the story one day. And when we were in Houston, I was getting my green card. I was in the process. She, got a, she had a job there. And as I got my green card, I was teaching private lessons. And this job literally just landed on my lap. Just a, a person came and said, hey, I need you to do this. And it was a, a job at a public school. And she was like, you know, I think it's almost time for us to have kids, so it would be good if you could get a job so you know I could stay home. So okay, all right, so let's do that. So I got the job, and in my first semester, I've always searched, I always learned. My mom always said this verse. My grandma always said this, the knowledge is the only thing that people cannot take away from you, steal from you. And my mom used to always refer to Hosea 4, 6. Oh, those hard books you find. Hosea 4, right after Daniel. Here it is. It reads this way. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou has rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. Thou, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. 
I will also forget thy children. It's very serious. And I think I took that, I've always taken that to heart. I always want to learn. And in my process of learning, I somehow got a hold on a book called The Broken Blueprints. If anybody's familiar with the book, it's by Vince. It talks about the principles of true education, according to the Spirit of Prophecy. And also tells some stories of uh, schools like this one that were found in the 1800s and what went right and what went wrong. And as I was reading the book, I realized that the public school is the completely opposite of what God wants for education. It's false education. And that was the job I had. I said, how, but, but God, how, you, you, you clearly gave me this job. How is it that, but this is wrong. And it's my very first year. And I was a first year teaching stuff for those that are teachers, you, you know. And, um, but you know, we prayed. And we learned about country living, you know. And I mean, I still have a lot to learn. Still have a lot to learn. Which brings to another verse, Numbers 12, 3. Because if you think you know it all, my brother, let's read this verse here. Numbers 12, 3. It reads, Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. That means that Moses was the most humble person on earth after Jesus. Isn't that interesting that he also saw God? He was one of the guys that came to the Mount of of Transfiguration and was right there. Moses, the most humble man. And I started praying too at that time when I realized this verse, man, God, make me humble, you know? And um, as we're praying, we try many different places to go, many different schools, and it never worked. Never worked. And, um, and like she said, we're just not ready yet, you know? Um, not ready because of our own characters and because I was neglecting my coworkers in my job. I wasn't being the light that I could have been to them. I suspect that if I had stood up for the truth earlier, maybe God had taken us out of there earlier. Right? But I chickened out. Can you, I think maybe, okay. I think we should cut it off, right? I was going to say give more detail, but. (laughs) Oh, well. (laughs) Well, when he finally stood for the Sabbath truth, that's when all the doors opened for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, when I was just blunt about what it is, not like, well, you know, but maybe you can try to move this from Friday to Thursday and try to, like, be very polite about it. I just decided to tell him, look, this is how it is, you know? And then, and they respected me for that. And, um, and then after that, literally, um, I went on the website a few weeks later for Watch the Hills, which the way that I came to know is uh, I was bummed about a school that didn't work out for us to go before here. And Pastor Lee, London Lee, not sure if you remember him, he was in our church where Pastor Ruben, that's the church we used to go, Waller, Ruben Carl, we used to go to that church. And I always liked Ruben and the way he handles the church business. And I always thought that he had a good education, but I never bothered to ask him, where did you go to school? And London Lee came, and I was just talking, he, he came, and he started talking to me. And for some reason, I just opened up to him, and then he said, you know, I worked in public school. I also work in conference school. I also work on blueprint school. But you know what's the best school I ever worked at? 
watch at the hills. So they have their problems, like any place does. But the spiritual environment in that place is like no place else. So let's pray that that stays that way. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, that was, that was providence. You know, God, uh, he's an amazing engineer. He just puts things right at the right place at the right time. Based even on our imperfections. Yeah. So, God is good. Amen. Wow, so many testimonies already. Oh, <clears throat> if you don't mind, let me say a quick prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you. Amen. <clears throat> oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. So me growing up, I'm going to start from the beginning because otherwise you're going to have miss a lot of stuff. Um, growing up, I came from a, I guess you can kind of say a spiritually nominal, you know, Adventist background. Uh, you know, my grandparents were Adventists and my my, and on both sides, and my parents were Adventists. And, but even as I was younger, I was always spiritually hungry. And so, thus the verse. I always had kind of this desire for a little bit more, but I didn't know that that's what I was wanting. Um, and so, you know, here I am, growing up in what I like to call Adventist ghetto, you know, in Keene. Um, even though I really like Keene, uh, I really do. Um, but sometimes it's easy to become complacent around other, other Adventists. Um, you know, everyone's kind of doing it, so it's like, oh, they're Adventists, you know, we all go to church together. And then temptations came my way that seemed innocent, you know. So first off, it was kind of like, you know, we'll go to church, and then we'll go to someone's house afterwards. And as soon as the sun, sun goes down, we put the music on, and then, you know. And, uh, and so it started that way. Started with, you know, a little dancing at someone's house. Then next thing you know, we're going to somebody else's house, you know. And then you go into someone else's house and there's like some drinking going on in the background, but it's okay, you know, we're having this, we're not doing that. We're just here for the fun. Fun. And uh, next thing you know, we're at clubs and other things. And so this verse is exactly basically what happened to me. We thought this was right. You know, we thought we were okay. There's a way which seemeth right to, unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And so, one step led to another, and I became a statistic. And, you know, there was, I met someone during all this, and, you know, there was intimacy before marriage, and then, next thing you know, we have a baby on the way, and, you know, we're getting married, you know. <laughs> We're right on the next step because even though, you know, it's funny because we were, we were both, at this time, we were both Adventists, you know, Adventists. Um, and so, luckily, you know, she was actually going to a really Bible-based church at this time. And so this is going on in the background, and we'll get back to that later. But she was going to a Bible-based church, believed in Ellen White, and, uh, but, you know, we did this because we're still kind of in the world, but kind of Adventists. And when we got married, and it kind of made sense when we got together because we both kind of wanted to kind of come back to God and, and grow. And I was like, you know what? We can, we can grow together, you know? We can, we can make this work. But very, very soon into the marriage, we realized that we were definitely ill-suited to make each other happy, to quote Ellen White, actually. I think it is. We were very ill-suited to make each other happy. Um... And I think it can boil down, at least on my side, to this one verse, and it's Ephesians 5.25. I'll give you guys a chance to get there. I know I'm reading them quickly, but we don't have much time. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That's a powerful verse. And I think a lot of people go over it, or they read the other part about the, the wife and how they're supposed to submit and all that. I think the guy, honestly, for me, I think it's harder, because the guy is supposed to die. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay? You're supposed to love her till you die. And more than that, I mean, you're supposed to give everything. It's like, you know, for me, I, in, 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 the, in the marriage, there was, there was problems, you know, things. And I, I, I thought, if I can backtrack a little bit, we agreed when we, when, we, when we got married that, you know what, we want a traditional marriage. We want, you know, I'm going to work, you're going to stay home, and whatnot. And unfortunately, both of us came from a background where we had like super moms, you know, she, they take care of everything, you know. <laughs> and so it didn't matter if you wanted your room dirty or not, it's going to be clean, you know, <laughs> and it's not going to be, it doesn't have to always be by you. And so, and so both of us came from this background, and you can imagine two people that are not used to and barely out of their teens, you know, 19, I was 19, she was 18, you know, not even out of their teens, living together, you know, you can imagine how I mean, think of some of your guys' dorm rooms or other people's dorm rooms. <laughs> you know, even some in the college. I don't know. You know? Uh, <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. <laughs> and, you know, you can imagine what it could be like. And, and so instead of, you know, being like, you know what? You know, it's, it's not working. You know, you're not, let, me, let me help you. You know? It was like, no. You know what? You said you were going to do this. And then you should, you should do it. And then she was like, yes, I'm going to do it. Then I was like, well, you want me to show you? And she's like, no, I'm going to do it. So both of us just budding. You know, it's, it's like foolishness. I should have just been like, you know what? I love you. It doesn't matter. I'll help you. Instead of just being this foolishness with arguing and <sighs> just ridiculous. So since we started the relationship off wrong, things weren't going right in the home. I would go work, I would come back, and I just, I actually dreaded coming home. And it was not a good feeling, you know? It's like sometimes you'd rather be anywhere else, and it's like, and you're dreading the fight, you're dreading the, what's gonna happen when you get there. And in this, since I failed in my part to love, she looked for love elsewhere. And at the same time this was happening, my job ended. And granted, it, you know, I'm not trying to put all the blame on her. I was hoping that it would end. Never hope that. That is the worst hope ever because even when it happens, you still feel terrible. You still feel dirty. You feel horrible. So even I thought I would find relief, I found no relief at all. And at the same time this was happening, my job ended, but God had a plan. God definitely had a plan. I was looking for what I can do with my life because, you know, I didn't have a job. I was, you know, recently just, you know, I'm just up in the air. And, you know, I tried to go to school, and the class they didn't, have enough cl uh, they didn't have enough students, so I couldn't even go to school. I'm just like, what am I supposed to do? You know, all the summer, the summer classes already started, so I was like, I'm just here in the summer with nothing to do. And, and you know, thank God I had a loving mom, you know, who unfortunately also went through a divorce. And she knew kind of the feeling, what I was going through. And so she decided, you know what, I'm going to distract them. I'm going to just, we're just going to go to all the church-related things that we can go to. You know? And I went to all kinds of stuff, stuff that I never even heard of. I was like, what? And, yeah, and then eventually I ended up at ASI that year. Um, I never heard of that one either, actually. <laughs> and at ASI, we were, uh, you know, I was enjoying it, all the different meetings and stuff. And next thing I knew, uh, I was walking through the, the booths and all, you know, some interesting different ministries and different things. But something just drew me in all of a sudden. And next thing I know, I'm in front of this OHC booth. And they're, like, telling me all these things, what the school's about and all this. And then this is where it comes back to the church I was going to. Now, even though I was not loving my wife as I should, I was not living as I should in many ways, I was still had a good church. And luckily, that church was a Bible-based church, and they believed in Ellen White. And I was actually growing even in, in the, the ill-suited marriage. Something we started early on was to read the Bible, and I was terrible at reading. <laughs> I was terrible at reading, and actually reading the Bible makes you smarter. I guess, you know, who would have thought, you know? I mean, it just, it just that's how God works. Um, 
and I was able to read for the, for the first time and really read in, for the first time in my life. And so even though this, all this other craziness, God met me where I was, and he was preparing me. And so here I am in front of the OHC booth, and they started telling me about all these things and, and what's going on. And it, one of my church members told me late, after all this that he was like, yeah, man, I saw that you were, like, searching. You were looking for something. And I'm here in front of this OHC booth, and I'm just like, God wants me here. This is where I need to be. This is where I'm supposed to be. Like, I just, I just knew it. So a few days later, literally a few days later, I was, like, packing my stuff, driving all the way to OHC, starting the first semester there. And oh, I can't tell you that. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I got here, and there was so much love and, and, like, just the way people were it was just amazing. I was like, wow, you know, God has other people that, like, are like me. You know, and they're searching. They're looking. They're like, they want something different. You know, I thought there was just, like, Southwestern and Andrews and all these big colleges, and, and like, I didn't know there was a small college, you know, another Adventist college. I mean, a lot of people don't even say it. You know, they're just like, oh, well, there's this college or that college. What are you going to do? I was like, you know? <laughs> no, there's other options. And, and luckily, I ended up here, and more than anything, I think God revealed to me here was his love and protection and his, I got you. Just, I, I got you. Like, don't worry about it. Everything's going to be okay. And I used to say it. I was like, man, you know, it's like, it's like I feel like God's, like, right there. You know, I can, I can lose, you know, at the time I had a car and like a few things. You know, I was still young and didn't have much. But, you know, I was like, you know what? Even if I lost all my, my vehicles, I loved my car. Some of you might remember stories from back then. I'm not going to get into that. But I loved my car. I loved, um, of course, my family and, and, and certain things. But I just realized that it's like, you know what? I don't really need this. Like, if I lost it, it would not be a big deal to me. You know, it would be sad if I lost, like, you know, an uncle or an aunt or, or even my mom or my dad or money or whatever the case may be. But I was like, you know, I'll be fine. God got me. Like, I'm... I don't have to worry about anything. And then I think I need to quote Job here when it says, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for naught? Hast thou not made a hedge about him? And then the test came. And I believe anybody who follows God will face a test. Yours may be different. This was mine. I knew God got me. I knew God had me. But Satan hit me in the one place that I was not expecting. And it was my daughter. I love my daughter so much. And my friends and my brother and my, my family was like, what are you doing over there? Your daughter needs you. She's in danger. Things are going on. You know, there might even be like drugs in the house. Who knows what's going to happen? What's happening? You know, who knows what's happening over there? I'm just like, what? What's going on? What? Really? I need, I need to go. I need to go back. You know, I can't. I need to take care of my girl. And as I was leaving, if uh, some of you might remember Mr. Pruitt or maybe some of you have met him before. Mr. Pruitt came to me, and he was like, so what's, what's going on? You know, why, why all of a sudden are you deciding to go? And this was during my second semester, probably about February. And he, he was like, well, I was like, no, well, this is happening, and that's happening. And it's like, you know, I, I, I just got to go back. I got to go back. And he's like, well, let me ask you some questions. So, like, where's she now? And he's like, well, she's with her, you know, this, blah, that. And, and then, well, what's going to happen? And, it, well, well, she's going to end up, you know, staying with, um, with her grandparents. And Mr. Pru, it's like, when, then everything should be fine. She'll be with her grandparents. She's going to be a safe location. You know, it's not going to be, you, everything will work out. Like, it's going to be okay. I'm like, no, 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 no. I have to go. I have to go. They told me, you know, this is happening. And I left. Granted, I knew that God wanted me here. I knew God wanted me here more than anything. It was the most for sure thing in my life was that God wanted me here. But I left. 
And um, I came home, and a few months into it, exactly when Mr. Pruitt said what happened, happened. There was no need for me to return. My little girl was safe. Everything was okay. And I was there. The moment I realized that, I should have been like, you know, I made a mistake. I need to go back. But I didn't. I let life start happening. Very soon into me coming back, you know, I, I hit the, the roller coaster, like many people may know or may, may even be going through. And what I mean by roller coaster is like, you know, you have a high point with God, and then you kind of go down, and then you're like, man, I can't, I can't live like this, and you go up, and then you hit another high point, and then you're like, oh, and go down. And granted, every time I hit a high point, the high points kept getting lower and lower and lower. And next thing I know, I'm not quite back to the level that I was before OHC, but I was getting pretty close. And here I am, you know, I'm living the American dream. I have stuff, it doesn't matter what, you know, it's just, I was comfortable. My debts were being paid off. You know, I didn't have any worries, but I was, I was uncomfortable. I was not happy with what I was. I knew I was not living right. And, and I, once again, I wanted more. I just wanted more. <clears throat> but all the, while, all the while, God still had a plan. So I ended up getting a job at uh, a city. Uh, ended up getting trained in, in uh, IT and all those kind of IT-related stuff. <laughs> and Elena was getting to the age where I didn't like the options of schooling around us. The school she was going to was OK. It's not, not bad. Uh, but you know there was things that were lacking that I saw. And I was like, I really want her to go to OHA. I know it's a really good place. I know there's not anything like it around here where I'm at. Let's go check it out. And, um, and actually, we came early because you know, she's in eighth grade this year. But I wanted her to go so bad that we, I brought her a year early. And uh, she checked it out, and she was like, what, you have to wear skirts and all this other stuff? And, and she's like, man, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to like this. You know? like, I think I, I'm speaking for her, but she didn't really say that, but I kind of read between the lines. You know? And I was like, you know, just go check it out. And she's like, Dad, you, uh, you know, she talked to her mom a little bit. She's like, and, and then she came back with some other things, and she's like, you, know, you can't force me to go to a school. And I was like, I never said you can force me. You have to choose this. <laughs> You have, to, you have to want this. I can't force you to go to this school. No one's going to force you. You have to want to come here or come there, go there. You have to want to go there. And so we came to the school. We're checking it out. And I'm just like, well, you know, go ahead and go with everyone else and check it out. And, and you know, as she's going with it, I'm trying to get feedback from her. And she's having fun. And she's talking with the other girls and stuff. And I'm just like, OK, you know, this is good. <laughs> and uh, I. I'm talking with the staff and other people, and I find out that they need an IT guy. That um, Mr. Ozeda was on his on his way out. He was plan had other plans, and he wasn't going to be coming back this this year. And I'm just like, well, I'm an IT guy, you know. <laughs> it's like, okay. I was like, I was like, but I started thinking. I was like, oh man, I want uh, you know, they might still remember me from back then, <laughs> you know, and. Um, I don't know how much, how much they might remember, and I'm not sure if they're even going to want me, you know? And so, and so I prayed about it. I was like, you know, I'll leave this on God. I know God wants me to do something. I know he wants me to change. And so I was like, you know what? I'm just going to put an application. I'm just going to go ahead and do it. Just whatever. And, and so I did. Put an application. I was as honest as I thought it could be without, you know, losing everything, I guess. <laughs> I tried to be honest. I really did. And I told them where I was at, where my, my current walk was, and, 
And I was like, you know, this is me. And, um, and so, wow, lo and behold, God opened the way, and he was like, you know what? I think I can use you. <clears throat> so, I do think I need to wrap up. I can't put in too much. But there is no greater joy than following Jesus and, doing, and teaching others to do the same. And I want to take part in that. And I, I hope that, you know, I, I had this big gap, and I feel like I, I stole something. I stole this time. There was 10 years since I walked in through those doors in OHC and then walked out. 10 years almost, almost exactly, well, not exactly, but 10 years. And not that I did all kinds of craziness out there or, or whatever. I fell. I did, I did a lot of things I, I'm not, not proud of, but it's not like I was just totally out there in the world. I really wanted to follow God, even in my fallen condition. But I regret the time that I, I feel like I wasted. If... I was talking to my brother Ralph just the other day, or today, I think even, and we were talking about, you know, like, what kind of Christian could you have been if you were a Samuel, you were a boy that, like, his mother raised him and taught him in the, in the right ways. At seven years old, he was, he was already had a decision, already had a choice to follow God, because no, and yes, God chose him, yes, but he was already taught coming up. And then when he got there, Eli's sons weren't good. So it wasn't Eli that taught him and showed him. It was, it was his upbringing from before. He's already had a connection with God. He was already growing. He's already wanting to, he's already dedicated. He already made that decision for himself. You know, you know what? I'm actually going to do it. I'm actually just going to follow God. Why not? I mean, and we think about Ellen White, we always think about like this old lady that, you know, had all these visions and things like that. She was, what, 14? No, 17. 17. 17. That was younger than half the room, or more than half the room. My goodness. And sometimes we think, like, oh, that person, you know, he's godly, but he's, like, you know, he's old already, you know. It doesn't take a long time to get close to God. He just wants a chance. So my prayer is that you can learn from my experience. Don't just go. If God called you here, it's for a reason. Because I want to be able to join together one day and we can sing as in Revelation chapter 15 verse 3. And it says, I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works. Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. I want to sing that with you. Thank you so much. Has it been a blessing to you to hear God's story in their lives? It just reminds us that we are all students. Whether we happen to be teaching some classes or sitting down listening to someone teach, uh, we are all students in the school of Christ. And what a blessing it is to have the great master teacher to share with us what we need and to bless us, to grow us. Let's kneel together as we close.
Oh, dear Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you for the way you've worked in the Smith's life. You've brought them here, and I know that every day is a journey with you for them. Pray for your blessing on them, that in the one of the most important ministries on this campus of what happens in the kitchen and the cafeteria, I pray that you would bless Menju and her whole team, that you would... Uh, Provide just what's needed to be able to have clear thinking and, and enjoy the blessings of food that you've provided for us. I pray that you will bless in the media ministry with Handel, that you would bring things together, that you would help uh, in efficiency and creativity and, and all of those things, that you would bring that together and uh, make it to, to grow and, and re be a, a real worldwide blessing. And I pray also for the Martins. What, a, what an encouragement to your work in their life. And you've brought them here to, uh, to bless us to be able to make beautiful music to praise you, to encourage others, to lift each other up. And I pray that you would just uh, work in a special way in their lives, that you would draw them each day closer to you and, and help them to be effective in teaching music and in, in encouraging others in that way. And Lord, I thank you for bringing Steve here. Thank you for working in his life. And I know that this isn't the only place we can grow. In fact, you're, when you send on students or staff, you send us on to grow and to continue wherever you plant us. But I thank you that you've brought him back here for himself to grow, for Elena as well. And we just pray that you would work through his ministry here. And Lord, we acknowledge that all of us staff and students stand on level ground at the foot of the cross, that we're in this together. I pray that you would help us to be... Uh, mutual encouragement to each other, that we would, we would be quick to pray for and with each other, whether it's staff or students, and, and that we would be growing and, and really be a place where your spirit dwells and where others can see you are faithful in our lives. So bless each one of us as we go from here. Thank you for the Sabbath and for your story in each of our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.